The following content is for entertainment and educational purposes only. It does not constitute means for diagnosis, healthcare advice, nor treatment. Make use of a qualified healthcare professional for such purposes. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Charlene Ortiz, and today we are going to continue with our lecture of sensation and perception. As we covered previously in our previous section, if you haven't watched the previous lecture, I'll have it linked down in the description below so that you have an opportunity to review and understand some of the topics that we have already covered. But essentially, we talked about sensation and perception and the relevancy when it comes to psychology. As you know, bless you. As you know, psychology is in the business of predicting behavior, right? And in doing so, we need to understand how is it that we sense, right? So how we receive stimuli through our receptors, right? So for example, our skin, our eyes, our tongue. And then that information is going to be processed for interpretation, meaning that that information is going to be processed later in certain areas of your brain. Now, previously, we did cover aspects of vision. And we're going to finish the aspects of vision, and later we're going to continue with the other senses. So let's get started. Now, we did talk about the normal process, right? The normal process through which we see things, through which we conduct that sensation of perception. But unfortunately, sometimes we will have misleading cues, right? Sometimes we will have, and we will be misled because of the cues that we are exposed to, right? So for instance, we may have a visual illusion, right? A visual illusion. And that's simply an inexplicable discrepancy, right? So we have the understanding of that visual stimulus, right? So that image, but then it doesn't correspond. It's not the same as we would expect from physical reality. Now, I'd like to show an example right, of some of these illusions, right? So one of the ones that I would like to talk about is the M's room, or the Amos room. And in this regard, what happens is we have a trapezoid-like room. And as you know, we're more inclined to use these corners in order to inform the distance between objects, right? But notice that because this shape is not common, it gives us the illusion that two children here, for example, who are indeed the same height, notice how it gives us the illusion that one of them is much smaller. So I'm going to present to you, I'm going to present to you how that illusion looks like. Lights, camera, perception. When you were little and some big kids pushed you around, did you ever fantasize about becoming bigger all of a sudden? Well, I did, and now I can, at the Exploratorium, San Francisco's Science Museum. How did I do it? The easy way by manipulating your perception. When you first saw me, I appeared to be normal size because you couldn't see the rest of the room. But as the lights came up and the camera pulled back, your brain performed a new instantaneous analysis. It now saw me as small. It added up all the visual information it had about my size and the size and shape of the room. And then it added in everything it knew from experience about the usual shape of rooms that they're rectangular and have right angles. So when I walked over here, your brain was convinced I was growing incredibly large because there was no other perceptual explanation, even though it wasn't logical. Let's look at it again, only this time from a different perspective. The room is not rectangular at all. It's totally distorted. There are no right angles anywhere. 
So that makes this clock, which is large and oval, look the same as that clock, which is small and circular, from your other perspective. The floor slopes upward, and as you can see, the ceiling slopes downward. So I'm not getting larger at all. You're just misperceiving my size because you think that you're the same distance from me when I'm over here as you are from me when I'm over there. But in fact, I'm twice as far away. All right, so if you notice, right? So if you notice in this scenario, right? We use the cues, right? We are utilizing the physical characteristics, right? We are using that visual stimulus, right? And factors to inform, right? For example, we assume that these are rectangular. We assume that the plots are circular. And that gives us the illusion, right? Our brain tries to fit in that information. Our brain is desperately trying to gather that data, right? That stimuli and make some sense of it. Any questions about visual illusions? Yes, sir. That's based on our experience of being used to the type of room. Does that mean watching one movie where they have special effects that you would watch when they used to dissolve having your perception of reality? You're correct. So the question was, or one of the comments was, well, we're used to that type of room, right? We're used to seeing things in that fashion. And he is correct because we are used to seeing rooms in that fashion. Although there are instances, for example, in certain populations, if I can pull that up here. Let's see. So there are certain groups, if I go ahead and share this information, notice that for some places that are not used to that type of structure. So notice they're not used to the rectangular aspect for those of you who are in engineering and civil engineering, you'll notice that some cultures are simply not used to having their structures in this fashion. So you would argue that individuals who are part of this culture wouldn't be as impacted in seeing this illusion, just like they wouldn't for visual effects. They wouldn't be as prone to seeing these visual effects as you as you and I would. The point of it was what could you watch so it could. And so he's saying just watching visual effects, can it affect my perception? Absolutely. I would argue that it affects your way of thinking as well. So for example, if I ask you what a nurse looks like, right? So generally, most of you probably thought about a female nurse, right? Because we're exposed to the media seeing, for example, nurses as female. Or if I were to ask you, what does a detective look like? Then you're gonna think about detective movies that you've seen before. So you're absolutely correct. Movies and special effects can inform our, I would argue as a way of thinking. So what does a therapist look like, right? And you're thinking about somebody, you know, a patient or a client sitting on a chair and then a man in his late sixties just, writing things out, right? Because that's your perception in the media. So you're absolutely correct, it could, absolutely. Any more questions? Good deal, good deal. Now let's talk about the stimulus of sound. The stimulus of sound. Now notice that we have to, we have to change that stimulation right, that stimulus, for example, a stimulus of sound or a stimulus of light, we have to change it later into that physiological experience of hearing, right? And very similar to the waves of light, notice that sound also behaves in the sense of waves, right? The first thing to take from sound is that it will behave as a wave, meaning that just like we discussed with light in our previous lecture, going to have an amplitude and it's going to have a wavelength, right? So amplitude, right? The height, the wavelength, the width, right? Now, this sensory input is later going to turn into auditory stimuli. Now, notice the sound 
as a way, because it behaves in a way, will need a physical medium in order to be transported, right? For instance, it will need air, or it will need another means of a physical medium in order to make it to us. Now, notice that sound waves do travel immensely fast, which is a great thing because I want to be able to, for example, if there's something that's dangerous, I want to be able to hear it. I want to be able to know that it is coming. So it is absolutely great that it does travel immensely fast. Now, how do sound waves occur, right? How do they occur? Well, in the means that they occur is because they are going to have, they're generated by vibrating objects, right? So basically we're going to have the vibration of an object. For instance, it could be a vocal cords, could be guitar strings, right? Sound waves are going to be produced based on the vibration of an object. Now, as I mentioned, just like the waves of light, right? They have those physical properties of wavelength, amplitude, and purity. Look at that perfect straight line. I'm getting better at this. I'm, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Now, we also have other physiological characteristics, right? We also have physiological characteristics of sound, we have pitch, loudness, and timbre. And I like to say in French, just tumble. Look at that. We're going to learn French today. We weren't expecting that so early in the morning, but here we are. We're going to learn some French. Any questions about the characteristics, right? About the characteristics of the stimulus of sound? Any questions? All right. Good deal. Let's talk a little bit more, more specifically, about hearing when it comes to humans. Now, remember that wavelengths are going to be described in the methods of frequency, right? Frequency in hertz, right? So for example, whenever we, we have sound and you're thinking about, okay, how do we measure sound? For example, if you measure temperature in, in Fahrenheit or Celsius, think about as frequency as another way to measure sound just like you would use Fahrenheit or Celsius for temperature. But what is frequency exactly? Well, if we go back to our slides, you see that a frequency is basically a cycle, right? Frequency is a cycle per second. So think about those of a vehicle, right? So when we have a vehicle, you know, there's there's certain revs per minute. So notice that in a very similar fashion, frequency behaves in the same way. Now, the higher the frequency, right? The higher the frequency, what we're going to come across is that we have a higher pitch. Now, just like with vision, that we're only able to see certain aspects of that wavelength, right, of light, we can also only hear but a small portion, right? We can only hear a specific range of sound. Let's think about amplitude, right? Amplitude. Now, if you remember in the illustration, right, we have sound wave, right? So amplitude would be that height, right? Amplitude is that height. And just like you would measure wavelengths, right? So that distance, just like you would measure wavelengths in Hertz, you would measure amplitude by decibels. So yeah, I'm getting better at drawing for my artist people out here. Doing progress, you should grade me. I feel pretty confident. Now, unfortunately, as all of you know, loud sounds can have negative effects on hearing, particularly they can cause both short-term and long-term damage. Interestingly, right, interestingly, 
younger generations tend to have a little bit more of, of hearing concerns. And you usually associate that with older individuals, but younger generations like you and I, right? So we have millennials, centennials. Usually the younger population is more exposed to basically have music accessible all the time. We have videos accessible all the time. So basically we have the stimuli, right? We have this, this stimulus occurring over and over again, right? Without being able to provide some sort of rest. Now, if we return back to our presentation, you'll notice that we also have other physical characteristics of sound as a stimulus, and we can talk about purity. And in this regard, what we're talking about is simply just one single frequency, right? Out of this vibration, right? Because that is the means that sound is going to be generated. So we're only focused on one single frequency, right? So just one single frequency. Any questions about hearing and the characteristics for humans? Outstanding. I got it from. All right, so let's move into the sensory processing of the ear. Let's go back to our presentation. Now, when we are thinking about the ear, generally when we think about the ear, we only focus on that external portion, right? So if I ask you what your ear looks like, draw it for me, you're probably just going to draw the external part. Now, let's think about the three main, let's call them chambers, if you will, the three main chambers, right? So first, let's talk about the external ear. I want you to think about the external ear basically as a funnel, right? It's going to gather that stimuli because remember, it's going to need that physical medium. And in this case, vibration is going to travel through those air molecules, right? Because it needs that physical medium as we explained earlier, right? So it's going to need that physical mean to be transported. So if I clear this up a little bit, notice that it will need that physical medium in order to be transported. Now, what's going to happen is how is this vibration collected, right? Through those airways, well, we're going to have the pinna. And the pinna, right, is basically what you and I refer to in lay persons as the ear, right? So it's basically this right here. It's basically what you and I as lay persons refer to as the ear. What's going to occur is that the pinna, right, because of its curvature, these little valleys and hills, you notice that it's going to collect that data, right? It's going to collect that information, that stimulus, I should say, and it's going to later move it towards the eardrum. It's going to move it towards the eardrum. Any questions so far? All right, good deal. Now, what's going to occur is that we're going to move a little bit more in depth. All right, we're going to move. We're going to move a little bit more inside of our ear. I want you to think that we're doing some form of travel, right? I'm going to pull up an image so that it is a little bit more easier to understand. So now we are starting to move towards the inside. Now we're going to go to the middle section, right? We're going to move towards the middle section of our ear. And in our middle ear, vibrations of our eardrum, right? This portion here, vibrations of our eardrum are going to be transmitted, right? To the three tiniest bones in your body. Usually we don't think about ears having bones, but they do, right? They're the tiniest 
ones. They're the tiniest ones that we have. Now, generally, they are referred to the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. So they're going to continue and carry on this method of vibration because remember, that is the method of sound. Once we start moving a little bit further, you'll notice that these three bones, which by the way, all together, they are known as the ossicles, right? All three bones, those tiny bones, are known as the ossicles collectively. What do the ossicles do, right? What do these little bones do? Basically, their job is to amplify, right? They're amplifying that vibration for you, right? So when this information was moving from your ear, your outer ear towards your middle ear, you'll see that your bones are going to amplify, right? They're going to amplify, your ossicles are going to amplify that signal. They're basically doing so by changing tiny air pressure, right? That's basically what they're trying to do, they change the air pressure. Let's go back to the presentation so we can move towards our inner ear, right? We're going to move towards our inner ear, right? Also, it's a little fun fact. Uh, generally, if you have any sort of damage, it tends to occur in the middle ear, right? So if you have any sort of damage, it tends to occur around mm, this area. It's when you typically have injuries to your ear. Actually, knew someone that got in a uh, let's call it altercation. We're going to call it that. They got in an altercation. They were hit in the ear, and actually, they lost their hearing because basically, uh, their middle ear uh, was exploded. Don't drink it. Don't do it. Don't do it. that. Happen. That's a true story. Hashtag facts. So let's move towards our inner ear. All right. So now we're moving towards the inner ear, and interestingly. We can actually zoom in a little bit more. And I'm going to pull up an image once we get to a little bit more of a description once we start moving into the inner ear. So when it comes to our inner ear, it's going to consist of the cochlea, right? Which is this structure here. And if you don't remember what the cochlea is, it's simply that structure that almost looks like a snail, doesn't it? Almost looks like a sea snail. So that is your cochlea. And the cochlea is basically, we're going to zoom in a little bit more. So if you're following me through this journey, if we zoom in a little bit more, right, it's going to look like this. All right, so we're zooming in. This is what the cochlea will look like. So what does the cochlea do? Well, first of all, it's filled with fluid, right? And it's filled with fluid and it's going to have inside of it, right? It's going to have inside of it that coil, that coil figure. And it's going to have inside of it the receptors for hearing, right? This is where we actually start this process, right? We're starting that process of turning this stimuli, right? We're going to move it a little bit closer to that interpretation, right? Sensation is what we sense. That stimuli, how we pick up that stimuli and perception is that when we start doing that interpretation. Now, if we zoom back, we zoom back out to our image, notice that we're going to have the bacillar membrane, right? The bacillar membrane inside our cochlea. And the bacillar membrane, what it's going to do. It's basically it's going to run through that cochlea, right? It's going to run through that cochlea. Basically through its entire length. Interestingly, within that bacillar membrane, you're going to have these structures, right? That are very hair-like, right? They're very hair-like. And if I show you an image, and if I try to show you an image of what they look like, so now we're going to zoom in even a little bit further. I would zoom in a little bit further. 
So now we zoom in from the ear to our inner ear to our cochlea. Now we're looking at the hair cells, right? So what's going to happen is that that hair cell, right? The hair cell is going to transform, right? That physical stimulus, right? It's going to transform that physical vibration. Now, that vibration is going to turn into a neural impulse, right? It's going to turn into a neural impulse because if you remember from chapter three, you'll recall that we need that electrochemical information in order to have that vibration stimulate our nerve, right? And if you remember, a nerve is simply a large neuron, right? Or a bundle of neurons. Now it's going to carry that information into our brain for interpretation. Now what I'll do is I'm going to show you a presentation of such. Let's pull that up. Let's see. Any questions so far about that travel, right? About that process. Any questions so far? Good deal. Pull this up. Sound is produced by a vibrating object like a tuning fork or vocal cords. When these items vibrate, they push air molecules into other air molecules. These molecules are pushed into more air molecules, and so on and so on, in a wave-like pattern. These are called sound waves, and they eventually make their way into the external auditory canal of the ear and reach the tympanic membrane, which is also known as the eardrum. The air molecules push against the eardrum, causing it to vibrate as well. This vibration then causes the first of the auditory ossicles to vibrate. This bone is called the malleus, and it's attached to the tympanic membrane on its proximal side. Its distal side forms a synovial joint with the second ossicle, called the incus, causing it to vibrate. Then the incus is attached to a third auditory ossicle called the stapes, which then vibrates. So the vibration is transmitted from the air coming into the ear to the tympanic membrane to all three auditory ossicles and into the oval window of the cochlea. The cochlea is divided into three chambers, the scala vestibuli, the cochlear duct, and the scala tympani. The two scala are filled with perilymph and the cochlear duct with endolymph. The oval window is the beginning of the scala vestibuli and the vibration of the stapes in the oval window causes waves of perilymph in the scala vestibuli. These waves cause vibration of the vestibular membrane in the floor of that chamber, which then causes waves of endolymph in the cochlear duct. The waves of endolymph cause vibration of the basilar membrane in the floor of the cochlear duct. Resting on that basilar membrane is what's called the spiral organ. The spiral organ consists of rows of auditory receptors called hair cells and a cartilaginous roof called the tectorial membrane. As the basilar membrane vibrates up and down, the stereocilia of the hair cells hit the tectorial membrane and bend. This will stimulate the opening of ion channels that initiate an electrical response. Once that vibration is transformed into that electrical impulse, that's when we start transporting that information into our brain. So any questions about that process? Good deal, fantastic. Let's go back to our slides. Let's see here. Hopefully a video is a good way to illustrate a little bit more in detail other than the images, of course, other than the uh, images. So there are multiple ways in which we understand and we try to understand the perception of hearing, right? So we have the theories of hearing. For example, first of all, we have place theory. And in this sense, what happens is the perception of that pitch is going to be represented and it's going to correspond to where that vibration is in different parts of the basilar membrane, right? So depending, right, depending which 
section, that vibration is occurring, right, within our cochlea. Notice that depending where that vibration occurs, it's going to generate a different form of pitch. That's what race theory involves. Now, interestingly, we have another method to explain pitch, which is the frequency theory. What happens with frequency? Well, that proposal, what it involves is that pitch involves not a specific, right? Not a specific place, but rather it's going to involve the frequency in which the entire the cellular membrane vibrates, right? So it's not a specific place, but rather it's the entire frequency, how much it makes that membrane I'm going to say twerk. I think that that will land a little better. So how much that membrane is working. Now what happens is that those hair cells, right? As illustrated previously, they're going to vibrate together. So that's the proposal for the frequency theory. It's basically the entire membrane is vibrating, meaning that the hair cells along that membrane are vibrating, right? They're sending that transmission. Now, notice that these two almost sound mutually exclusive, right? It's either in one spot or the entire thing, right? So place theory proposes, no, it's in a, in a single spot. That's what determines pitch. And frequency theory says, well, hold on. I think it's in the entire membrane, right? The entire membrane of that nucleus. But notice that we can indeed, we can indeed reconcile both theories, right, both place and frequency. And we've come to understand that it depends on both, right? So both theories have some credence, just like if you remember from our, our previous lecture about opponent processes and frequentic theory of color, you remember that the frequentic theory says, well, when we add these colors and we have three basic colors and that's what we use to inform our vision and our vision and color and then the opposing opponent process says well hold on it's not necessarily that it's more like in blue right if a blue receptor is active that means that it's going to inhibit our red receptor right so this is very similar right it really depends on both right there's not one method specifically we usually utilize both in order to understand and have that perception of hearing. Now, any questions about that? Good deal. Good deal. Now, they both turned out to be valid. But let's move a little bit more towards how is that we localize, right? Our perception of sound, right? How is it that I know that you guys know that this sound, the sound of my voice, is coming from the front, right? It's coming from, hopefully, right? it's coming from, from here. Well, notice that the sound waves are going to travel basically in that opposite direction, right? So notice that we will use different cues. So for instance, we have sound coming from the left. It's going to reach the left you're sooner than that of the right. So for example, because it's going to have that extra distance that it would have to travel, right? So we have the sound source and notice that it will have to travel just that much longer, right? So notice how this one is much shorter than the next one, right? So we will have to make up for that distance. Because of that, it's going to be more, it's going to be less intense, right? It's going to be a little bit more difficult because it did indeed have to travel, right? So if I clear this image here, right, if I clear that image here, notice how it did have to travel right, right here. This one traveled right here. So it had to travel a little bit of a longer distance. And because of that, we utilize these cues in order to localize those sources. All right. Any questions about sound? Oh, smell. 
taste of smell. Now, notice that with smell, we're going to have different clusters, right? We're going to have different clusters of taste. And these cells are going to be found within your taste buds, right? So if you notice, you're going to have your taste buds and they are going to basically line up, line the trenches, right? Around these tiny bumps, right? So we're going to have those little dips, those little trenches. They are basically covering your tongue. Notice that maybe this morning you had a hot pocket or something like that. You had some pizza rolls, you had some coffee, you burn your tongue. That's okay because your taste buds are going to be replaced within 10 days, right? So generally it takes about 10 days for those cells to be replaced. That is why if you burn your tongue this morning during coffee or eating a hot pocket, maybe I'm hungry. I keep talking about hot pockets and coffee. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe that's it. All right. Now we do have primary taste, right? We do have primary taste. And although there's some debate about that, but for the sake of this class, we're going to talk about our taste. Now notice that previously we were talking about our taste buds, right? Our cells. What they do is that they absorb those chemicals, right? They absorb the chemicals that are dissolved in your saliva, right? So they're going to absorb that chemical dissolved in your saliva. And that is going to trigger, right? Those chemicals are later going to be transported into your thalamus, right? They're going to be transported to your thalamus in order to be set and processed through your brain. Now, as I said, we do have primary taste. So some, some debate about that. So let's go back to our slide. Now, generally speaking, we have the taste of sweet, sour, bitter, and salty. Now notice that we also have another taste, which is generally referred to as mommy, which is Japanese or savory. For savory. Now, there are people who are very, very sensitive, sensitive, right, to certain taste. Generally, we fall within a middle ground, right? We're not non-tasters or super tasters, right? Generally, non-tasters refers to people who only have one fourth, right? So 25% of taste buds, right? So you may have that friend that just simply, oh, this doesn't taste like anything. It tastes like paper, it tastes like cardboard. Well, he's probably a non-taster, right? Because he probably only has about one fourth of all the taste buds. Whereas individuals who are super tasters, right? Individuals who are super tasters, they tend to be about 25%. They tend to be about 25% of the population. But generally, most people fall within that middle range. Now, pretty interesting. Uh, when I was in college and undergrad, like you guys, I volunteered for a lot of research. And, and you're like, well, that explains a lot, right? That I volunteered for a lot of research when I was in college. And what they did, they were doing exactly this. They were trying to find out which individuals were super tasters or non tasters or basically, you know, basic people. They were basic. Uh, it turns out I'm a super taster. Everything that they had me taste, you know, there were things that were, they would have a little strip of paper and then they were dipping it in different types of, of solutions, right? And they would ask me and the rest of the participants what it tasted like. And I remember one so clearly because they had dipped the little strip and then they gave us a strip all the participants. And then I was the only one that could taste it. It tasted awful. It tasted like like really antique ink, you know, when you would dip the, the quail, kind of like that. It tasted awful. I was the only one that could taste this. So it turns out I'm super tasty, right? Turns out I guess I, I can taste things well, which I mean, that could be a blessing and a curse, wouldn't it? 
right? Sometimes we don't want to taste stuff, and sometimes we do. That's an interesting little fun fact. Now, we also have fading effect, right? We have a fading effect. This is simply when we are adapting to that, with, to that stimuli. We're simply adapting to that stimuli. That is simply a gradual decline because we have been exposed for a long time to that stimuli. You can also look at that with smell. I think with the sense of smell, it's a little bit easier to understand. Of course, we're going to, uh, we're going to color that for sure. Any questions about taste? Any questions about taste? All right. All right. Now, individuals do note that there really is no actual way to quantify how much of smell influence taste, right? We do understand that it is a significant contributor, right, to taste, right? So if you have a cold or flu or something like that, or Rona, if you have Rona, please don't show up to class or let yourself folks that I love you to bits, but just don't show up to class. Love you to bits. But sometimes we will have an illness or things of that nature that doesn't, or medication, things like that, that don't allow us to taste, right? They don't allow us to taste because our noses are maybe we are congested, we have some sinus issues going on. So we do know there is an importance, right, between smell and taste, but simply we don't have the right means to quantify it as of yet. Now, let's go to smell, right? Since we're talking about smell, let's do that, right? Smell refers to that sensory system. And it's going to resemble taste in many ways. So since we already covered taste, Understanding of olfactory system should be relatively analogous, right? It should be about the same. Just like with taste, we rely on chemical substances, right? We rely on chemical substances. And these chemical substances are going to be dissolved in fluid, right? So for example, your mucus. So with taste, those chemical substances are dissolved by saliva. And in the case of smell, right, those chemical substances are going to be dissolved by mucus. So how does it, they're pretty analogous to one another, right? They're pretty analogous. Now, when we're talking about the olfactory cilia, these are just like the hair structures in your cochlea, right? Or hair-like structures, I should say. We also have something really similar in our noses, and they are located at the very top, right? They are located at the very top of your nose. And I'm actually going to pull up an example about, about that. All right, so let's pull that up so you can see it a little bit better. Here we go. This will work just fine. So notice in this illustration that we have here, notice that when those chemicals, right, those particles travel and they come and pass through our nasal cavity, we're going to have these hair-like structures, right? We have these hair-like structures just sitting above, above that nasal cavity. And interesting, interestingly, what's going to happen is that there's a very quick interpretation because if you notice, it's sitting right here where we do our interpretation, right? We have a factory track. It sits just, just right there, very close to where the, the information, those chemical processes and, and particles are being sent to. We're very close to our brain, right? So the information is going to be interpreted fairly quickly, right? So this is pretty interestingly interesting because if you notice for sound, it had to pass through this entire process and it took a minute before we actually shoot it down to 
our nerve so it can be interpreted, right? So it took, it's a long trek, right? And with taste, it was, an, it was also a long trek. But notice that for smell, it is not. For smell, it's actually pretty short, right? It's a pretty short trek. Notice that within those receptors, right, they're going to move up that olfactory ball. So they're going to move up that olfactory ball. And through this olfactory ball, they're going to be sent to the olfactory tract. Now we're going to conduct this process of interpretation. What is it that I am smelling? What is it that I am smelling? Now, because it's so quick, right? Because it sits just under, right? It just sits under our brain, right? That olfactory bulb sits right above of that nasal cavity. It is the only sense that it's not going to be routed through our thalamus. Right? It's the only one. If you notice that type of interpretation is very quick. Notice that it didn't have to be sent to our thalamus to be sent and routed to different areas of the brain to be interpreted. Basically, that interpretation remains right here. It's very quick, unlike our other senses, right? Our other senses will be processed through the thalamus. Think about the thalamus as that, as that distribution center in a factory, right? Sends the inventory to different places. But with our sense of smell, it doesn't have to go through the thal thalamus. It doesn't have to go through the process of being distributed just like it would, just like inventory would in a factory. Right? So it doesn't have to be transmitted like that. So any questions about the sense of smell? Any questions? Good deal. Let's move towards the sense of taste. Let's move towards the, the sense of feeling, I should say, not taste. Now, we are thinking about the sensory systems of the skin. Think about that physical stimuli that is mechanical, it is thermal, and it is chemical, right? It's that form of energy, and that form of energy is going to come into contact with the skin. What's going to occur is that these cells in our nervous system are going to respond and they're going to be sensitive to specific patches, to specific areas in our skin. Right? So we're going to have specialized cells in our skin that are going to be responsible for specific mechanical, thermal, and chemical stimuli, right? So in your skin, on your skin, and inside your skin, you're going to have specific receptors. For example, you're going to have receptors for pain. You're going to have receptors for temperature. You're going to have receptors for pressure, right, for weight. So notice that it takes a wide variety of receptors in order to distinguish between those different types of physical stimuli, right? My mechanical, my thermal, and my chemical stimuli. What's going to happen after you have this thermal stimuli? What's going to happen after you have this mechanical stimuli or chemical stimuli, right? What's going to occur is that the nerve fibers, right? The nerve fibers are going to carry that incoming information, right? They're going to carry that information later to be routed between two specific pathways, right? And as you know, our thalamus is our little distribution center when it comes to dispersing and distributing that sensory information. But we're also going to have the somatosensory vortex. You remember from our previous chapter, if you remember from chapter three, you recall that we have a somatosensory cortex and it's going to sit in our parietal lobe. 
Yes, sir. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the specific passion in that pressure of the feeling. If you have a very fine, sharp object that hurts itself with the passion. That actually, so the question was, if I prick myself in certain areas of the skin, will I not feel it, right? The answer to that falls into Weber's law, right? And Weber's law, very quickly, what it says is we need a certain amount of stimuli in order to be felt. So if you're pricking yourself with a needle, you'll notice that it will require just a minimum amount for it to be perceived. That minimum depends on the species, right? That minimum may be different for us as it would for like say chimpanzees, as it would for fish. That depends on the amount of stimuli, right? So that if, if you like to, uh, it's pretty simple, right? So there's a whole equation for it. So it's basically corresponding. So you have one variable and then how much of this corresponds to the other. So it's a really simple equation. It's really simple. And then we already have the parameters for many different types of stimuli. So if you, if you want to look into it, it's called Weber's law. And you'll see how that stimuli, how much stimuli would we need to feel it, right? So it would take that specific constant. It's one of the few constants that we have. Does that answer your question? Yes, I think more of the one that says that such a specific passion. Right. So I would think that would be really difficult because you need to remember these receptors are in the, the millimeter less than, so for you to be able, you know, a needle is probably thicker than the millimeter of those receptors. So it's eventually going to, to hit that receptor or receptor pain, for instance. So the needle will be thicker than, than that. Does that answer your question? All right, let's go back to our slides. Now, how many of you would like to live without pain? Just no pain, nothing ever hurts, right? No toothaches, no backaches. That sounds like heaven, right? It sounds really good, doesn't it? Unfortunately, I hate to tell you, but pain is actually a good thing. And you're thinking that is crazy. Well, it's not because pain allows us, pain allows for your survival, believe it or not. Pain is a warning system, right? Pain is a warning system that is immensely necessary for our survival. Now, in keeping with what our friend was asking, right? These types of receptors that we may or may not feel right, because of the, the thickness of a needle, remember that pain receptors um, may basically just open and free nerve endings, right? They're very, if you remember, we have our little axon with a little uh, dendrites, right? So notice that a nerve is basically a bundle of, of neurons Basically, these wouldn't be protected. They're immensely open, which makes them, which makes them very, very sensitive. Very, very sensitive. I need to remind you, pain is subjective. Pain is subjective. Right? You've probably been to your doctor, your, your physician, and if you're a mental health doctor, right? Pain is subjective. You've probably been to your physician and they'll ask you on a scale two from zero to 10, how much does that hurt? They don't tell you exactly how much it hurts. You tell them how much it hurts because whatever is a five to you, maybe an eight for me, right? Whatever is a eight for you might be a two for me, okay? So notice that pain is subjective. I will equate that to mental health as well. People view trauma in different ways. So for a person, maybe being in a car accident, they don't view it as traumatic. It's just another day down, you know, Walt Wallace, right? It's just another day on Parkway, right? But for another person, they may view a car accident as an immensely traumatic experience, right? So even in the sense of mental health, we can see that translation between physical aspects 
and psychological perception, right? Now, how is it that we have these different explanations, right? How is it that we have these different explanations? Because you're thinking, well, if these receptors are so biological, why is there such a difference between what you view as painful, and what I view as painful? We have come to the understanding of the gate control theory. Gate control theory. And what it means is that that sensation, right, that reception of pain has to pass through some form of gate. And remember, gate, I don't mean it in a physical sense, right? I don't want you to look for an MRI picture or something. Where's that gate, right? But it is considered that that gate will be in the spinal cord that can be closed, right? And once it is closed, it's going to block, right? It's going to block those pain signals. So if I give you an illustration, how many of you have had pain blocks before? Anybody has had a pain block here? Well, I have had pain blocks. Unfortunately, I have, unfortunately I have a really bad back. Pain blocks, are basically utilized in regards to this theory. So what they do, it's basically you receive an inge injection directly into your spine, right? So that we stop that communication between the location of the injury and then block that communication, block that gate, if you will, close that gate, so that information doesn't get sent out. Now, I'll show you a small illustration. Think about, think about, let's see, this one won't open, so let's try another one. Okay. So think about, in this case, right, if I share my screen for those of you watching at home, Think about, so my injury is pretty low, right? My back injury is super low. So it's around this general area, right? It's a really low injury. So notice that with the gate control theory, what it proposes is if I can shut down, right? If I can close that gate, that communication between the location of that injury, right? If I shut this down here and I block, that's why it's called a pain block, if I block that communication between your spine, trying to tell your brain, hey, Something weird is going on, interpret it as pain, please. And your brain would interpret that as pain. And therefore, your interpretation of this injury will be painful, right? So notice that with the gate control theory, what we're trying to do is shut down, is close down that gate so that communication is not sent, right? It's not sent to your brain so that we can control and do some pain management, right? So that's what the gate control theory exposes. So any questions about that? All right, so with a pain block, they, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, how does it know what specifically the block is? It block all? I'm sorry? How does it know specifically which specifically the block? So the question was, how would it know what specific pain to block? Before you're given uh, such treatment, right? One of the things that's going to happen is, of course, you'll have an MRI or you have some sorts of imaging to know exactly where the location is of that injury, right? So they will look up exactly where that issue is located from, and then the injection is going to be given directly to that site. So remember, let me see if I can find an image right here. Here we go. I gotta tell you, it didn't work for me. I've had it done a couple of times and it just it didn't work. So if you see in this image, if I can share it for those of you watching at home, notice that with the gate control theory, what we're trying to do is block this communication. So notice that in this image, this is the site of the injury, right? In this example. So you see how, because of medication, we're trying to block that communication so that this information of this injured, remember, because pain is a communicator of survival, right? It's letting me know there's something wrong. So what we're trying to do is not allow that communication so it doesn't go back up to the brain through our nerves or interpretation. 
So basically what I'm trying to do is block this information here, close that gate, right? in order for that communication not to be sent up to the brain for interpretation. So we're stopping the sensation from perception, right? So we're only gonna have the sensation. It's not going to go up for that perception. So I've had this procedure done a couple of times. Unfortunately, it hasn't really worked for me. I'll actually feel it makes it a little worse. Um, but fortunately, it hasn't worked for me, but it does work for many, many people. Now, something really interesting about our skin. Remember, we talked about pain, right? But other than pain blocks, as I mentioned with that injection, we also have natural pain blocks, if you will. And those are endorphins. And endorphins are basically our own body trying to produce chemicals that are immensely similar to those of painkillers, right? Of morphine, right? Have you ever been injected with morphine? I've had in the past. It's not enjoyable. I'll tell you that. It's not enjoyable. It, it shuts everything else down, right? What it's trying to do is that it's trying to mediate Right, it's trying to mediate that neural pathway, right? It's trying to subdue that neural pathway so that we can suppress that pain, right? It's trying to cut and shut down that communication, communication right? Now, interestingly, a glial cells, if you remember from our previous chapter, it is understood that they may contribute to the regulation of they may contribute to the regulation of pain. Now let's do a little bit of a review, right? Let's do a little bit about a review for this chapter. So notice that one of the things that we mentioned is that psychology as a field is theoretically diverse, right? We can't just use, for example, just experiments, right? You can't just use social psychology. You just can't use biological psychology, evolutionary psychology, experimental psychology, statistics. We need to use a wide variety of fields in order to understand behavior, right? So imagine if you're trying to, in the field of physics, for example, if you're trying to find out the velocity, right, of an object, well, you just can't worry about speed, right? You have to worry about, say, for example, wind resistance. You have to worry about other aspects that could affect velocity. Psychology is the same way. We can't just focus on one aspect, just like a person who's getting their degree in physics cannot focus on just speed, right? They have to focus on acceleration, wind resistance, the surface, right? Psychology is the same way. We just cannot use just one thing, right? In order to explain processes of sensation. Interestingly, as we mentioned earlier in our previous lecture, and again, that will be linked in the description below, we talked about the trichromatic and opponent process theory. Now we have a good understanding because we know that we both use our three basic colors and the opponent process theory. We use both of them in order to provide an understanding for color vision. Now, something to remember is even though I just explained to you the very basic and fundamental aspects of sensation, right? Even though it's so biological, you need to remember that experience of the world is immensely subjective, right? It's immensely subjective, right? It is subjective because perception as a method to understand the world is inherently subjective, right? So for some of you, some of you may say, the weather is kind of nice outside, you know, it's not super hot. Whereas for some of you may say, it's kind of chilly today, isn't it? Right? Some of you are wearing hoodies and things like that. I'm wearing a jacket, right? Although I love cold weather. I mean, my house is always at, at 65. All the time. You can imagine my electric window. <laughs> my house is always at 65. I love cold temperature. But notice that if you were to pay me a visit in my house, you probably feel really miserable. 
right? It's like six and five over here. That's crazy. That's funny weather. I don't think any weather. <laughs> right? That is because your perception, even though the sensation seems like it's so objective, we have the vibration. The vibration hits the pinna, the pinna hits the eardrum. It sounds so objective. It sounds so physical. My perception of that sound is going to be subjective. Think about this, right? At, at my home, you know, I don't like yelling, even if it's for something good, right? Like, say, for example, like, whoa, you know, uh, somebody's happy at home and then we're playing video games. I'm like, oh man, I beat her, right? I don't like yelling at home because for the, some of you, you may say, oh, that's good, you know, they beat the, you know, they beat the game. So they're cheering. For me, my perception, there's an emergency. That's my perception. So every time I hear yelling, like, what's going on, right? So my perception, right, is different, right? Because of what? Life experiences, right? For example, I was in the military 10 years. I had two tours, right? So when I hear yelling, my perception, even though it was the same as yours, we went through the same process of hearing the same thing, my perception is going to be subjective. But generally, if I hear a, a yell, I'm not going to perceive that something happy and cheerful, right? I'm going to perceive it as, there's some sort of emergency going on, there's something wrong, right? Because of our experience, because of our experience. Interestingly, your behavior will be shaped by your cultural heritage. We have different cultural differences, attitudes, values, social behavior. Right, social behavior that are going to contribute to those differences of perception. So, for instance, let's talk about the military as a culture. Right, for those of you who have either been in the military or want to join the military or know something, uh, someone that has been in the military for a while, you notice that they behave different. Right, they behave a certain way. Right, because military, law enforcement, that is a whole subculture in myself. Just like identifying as Mexican-American, just like identifying as a Black American or African-American or Nigerian or uh, identifying as a Christian, right? identifying as a Muslim, whatever the case may be. That is going to have, believe it or not, an impact as to how you have this perception. Right? It's going to have an impact on how you have the perception. And I think a really clear cut example is the one that I just illustrated, right? Whereas, you know, members of my family playing a video game and they're cheering, right? This is a happy moment for them because they just beat the game. Whereas for me, I will jump up, right? See, the problem is that I have two settings business casual or homeless woman. I have like two, you know what I'm saying? I have like two styles business casual or homeless. I'm wearing like, you know, basketball shorts and flip-flops, like, what's going on, you know? So, I'll look to you. <laughs> I'll look to you in the next. I do want you to remember, however, that even though there are so many differences, I need you to remember that the similarities generally outweigh those differences, okay? So, the similarities do tend to outweigh those differences. As I noted, some cultures will be a little bit more susceptible, susceptible, I should say, to illusions. As for example, as I was mentioning to a friend earlier, he brought up the instances of visual effects. And yes, a culture like ours that's constantly bombarded with special effects. And if we take that to another culture that is not bombarded with visual effects, they would see it differently. And notice that that will have an inherent factor, inherent factor in your perception. Any questions about that? All right. 